Hello, this is Paul Check. Welcome back to part four of the challenges of mouth breathing. Part four, we're going to talk about the biochemical elements of it today. First and foremost, what do I mean when I say biochemical? Well, biochemistry relates to molecules that are chemical, particularly in this case within fluids. Bio means life chemicals. And what we're talking about when we're relating to biochemical issues of mouth breathing is our biochemistry is really about the flow of energy and information through the fluids in our body. The fluids that make up our biochemistry are largely made of hormones, neurotransmitters, uh, proteins that become amino acids through, once they go through digestion, fats, carbohydrates, minerals, trace minerals, vitamins, cofactors, and all those types of chemicals that ultimately produce the flow of energy and information in our body. There's quite a lot of individuality. Um, if you look at Roger Williams' book, Biochemical Individuality, there's a lot of great information in there, and he shows that there's quite a lot of diversity between human beings. The specialists that look at our biochemistry are now largely the functional medicine practitioners. Most doctors do look at your biochemistry, but in, shall we say, a fairly narrow or specific focus, functional medicine practitioners do a, a broad array of tests to determine how the balance of these various elements are. The one challenge with that approach is it's like taking a snapshot of an individual and you don't know how it got that way. My approach is to look at the things that ultimately produce our biochemistry, which is largely the things we bring from the outside to the inside, such as water, air, food, and drink and the chemicals that we choose to add to such mediums. So if your biochemistry is not balanced, then you end up having a variety of different kinds of symptoms from fatigue to mental emotional changes to uh, problems in organs and glands and tissues. And the reason I'm talking about the biochemical elements as it relates to breathing is because breathing is a very, very important influence on our biochemistry and the body uses the breathing mechanism to adjust imbalances in our biochemistry as I will show you as we go on. What I've done because my big interest as a therapist is not addressing the symptoms that leads to biochemical imbalances but identifying the causes of them because if you keep on adding something to compensate for something that is the symptom of something you're doing, like eating incorrectly, then all you're really doing is using a patch technology and that's not going to be a very long fix that's going to really help you. It's going to actually take you further and further into the pathology because every day you go on, the imbalance just gets worse typically. And the biochemistry of the human body is extremely complex. Some physiology texts say there's about 6 billion biochemical reactions a second, which I think is extremely low. You have about 100 trillion cells, all of which have a myriad of biochemical reactions each second. So if you just look at the number of cells in your body and the biochemical reactions in one cell, the number of biochemical reactions that go on just to keep you alive and thinking and moving and breathing and being is very, very, very massive. So to help you better understand how biochemistry relates to breathing, I'm going to look at the issue through the six foundation principles that I teach in my Holistic Lifestyle Coach program, which starts at level one, a three-day course open to anybody that wants to come. The only prerequisite is my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. HLC 2 is professional training and HLC 3 is advanced professional training. I'm going to present this in a way that hopefully everybody can follow me and understand so you can see how does this relate to mouth breathing and if you're a mouth breather, what are the simple things that you can do to minimize your chances of having to mouth breathe as a compensation for something that you don't really need to do. 
Now before I get started, I want to make the point that the number one cause of mouth breathing that I see clinically, aside from the ones I've already addressed, but as it relates to biochemistry, is people eating and drinking things that produce excessive mucus as an, an immune reaction to things that their body does not want in the body. It's trying to get it out. Anytime you have an immune reaction, typically you're going to have mucus formation and that will clog your nasal airways and immediately trigger you into mouth breathing. Um, there's uh, many other issues that you know can be uh, related to this as I'm going to talk about but if you're somebody who is uh, one that I talked about with a imbalance in the cranial rule of thirds and you already have a, a narrow middle third and a narrow maxillary arch you're already shall we say compromised so if you were one of the people that found that you had a compromised middle third, paying attention to the issues I'm going to talk about under the heading of biochemistry is very, very important because if you don't be very careful, you can trigger mouth breathing and postural changes that lead to many other problems such as musculoskeletal problems, headaches, joint issues, and, and the list just goes on and on. So those of you mouth breathers that... Uh, have congenital issues as I described in the previous uh, discussion should really pay more attention to this than those of you that aren't necessarily mouth breathers that are just watching for general interest. So what we'll do is we'll start with our six foundation principles. I classify three of them as yin, three of them as yang. Yin is the feminine, the inclusive, moist, cooling. Our first one is hydration. Water is probably the most important thing we have in our body when it comes to surviving other than oxygen because without water it doesn't matter if you have food. <laughs> if you don't have uh, oxygen or something to breathe then it doesn't matter if you have water. But the water in your body is the medium by which all biochemistry works. It's the, it's the medium of energy and information transfer. So having water deficiency or water challenges is going to create a lot of biochemical problems. In my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, I give these criteria and a fair bit more information that you'd find useful. First of all, remember to drink half your body weight in ounces of water a day. That's a general working rule of thumb. Certainly there's going to be people that might need more due to uh, being in areas where there, uh, there's a lot of heat. Uh, or where they're, they're sweating a lot or where they're doing a lot of physical exercise and there's areas where you uh, times where you may not need as much water as that but that's a general working rule of thumb and nobody's going to hurt themselves with that formula there's another standard rule that's used across the board by many medical professionals and that's drink eight cups of water a day but that does not accommodate for size differences in bodies and as you know People can get real tall and real short and be quite heavy and quite small. So eight cups is uh, too loose for me, but half your body weight in ounces of water a day. After years and years of testing and doing this with myself, I found it to be a very reliable amount of water for the average human body. Water should be at a pH of seven or more. We'll talk about pHs as we go. But generally, the pH scale balances at 7. So at 7, you're at neutral pH. If you go lower in pH, it gets more and more acid till you get all the way down to zero. The stomach acid is somewhere around 1 on the pH scale or even slightly less. That's extremely acidic. That'll dissolve metal. And then on the alkaline scale, you go up to 14. So alkalinity then is, is the functional antagonist of acidity. But remember... Alkal two alkalines not good either so each compartment of your body many different compartments have different working ranges for pH your stomach pH is different than your small intestine than your colon than your blood than your urine than your feces than your saliva and if you look in a physiology text you'll see that the body has many working pH ranges but in general water is seven because if we 
we're drinking something that had too much pH influence, it would constantly be throwing our biochemistry out of balance. So water is kind of a neutral carrier in that sense. Typically, most people run quite acid these days due to all the things I'm going to discuss here. So there is a real tendency out in the public to popularize higher levels of alkalinity in water. So some waters go up as high as 9 on the alkalinity scale or pH scale. And we, we can look at that more, but if, just as a general rule of thumb, if you know that you have a condition where your body's under a lot of... Uh, demonstrating signs of too much acid, then drinking a more alkalinized water could be beneficial to you. But as I always encourage my students to do and all my clients to do, pay close attention to how your body's responding. Just because it sounds good on a television commercial or in a magazine doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be the best thing for you. Total dissolved solids relates to how much mineral content is in the water. Total dissolved solids, based on the uh, research that I did years ago, which was a fair bit of it, ideally we want a total dissolved solids of 300, and most of the bottles of water out there, not all of them, but a lot of them, tell you what the total dissolved solids is. <clears throat> now, many of those waters out there, Avion is at 309, and that's my, my choice of waters for myself. I do very well on Avion, but many of the Waters that are sold are very, very low in total dissolved solids, so they're what I call naked waters. And when people drink waters that are too naked for their body, it throws their sodium balance off and can disrupt sodium potassium and many other uh, chemical exchanges in the body. And, and the body responds to that by urinating that stuff out quite fast, so it's like the water just runs right through you. So one of the things that we that I recommend is experimenting with some good high quality sea salt which mineralizes the water and salt has an alkalinizing effect on the water and by adjusting the mineral content of the total dissolved solids one you can make the water a little bit more alkaline and two you're bringing in minerals and trace minerals and cofactors or uh, nutrient factors micronutrition from the ocean because your salt carries things like microplankton and things there's up to about 40 elements from the ocean that can be found in high quality uh, sea salt so there's a lot of shall we say biochemical support that most people need and minerals and trace minerals have very important regulatory functions on our uh, biochemistry such as hormonal regulation uh, vitamin utilization and things like that naturally the water needs to be clean and um, clean means more than just filtered. Clean means water that has not only is clean, i.e. filtered, but water should be energized. It should be from a quality source. Spring water is a very good source. Artesian water is the highest quality source uh, for many reasons that I don't have time to explain. But artesian means it's being pushed up out of the earth by the natural forces of the earth. If you read the research of Victor Schauberger, who is, you know, you know, really probably put out more great information on water than most people. He showed in his books how the earth prepares the water and pushes it up and says that out in nature animals will walk miles to artesian well sources because of the quality of the water and they know what they're looking for. Now, with water we have to be very, very concerned about toxicity. So there's a lot of things that get into water that research now shows that can be extremely disruptive to your biochemistry and typically what you'll find is as a person's biochemistry becomes aberrant or out of balance there's changes in the breathing mechanism as well typically what you're going to find is most of the waters are toxic to the body and have the risk of making the body more acid uh, at which time you're going to see the body begin to start to hyperventilate to try to alkalinize the blood in particular. So that the biochemistry is off, it challenges the body's ability to maintain the blood at the right pH level of 7.35 roughly. Depends which textbook you read. It's very close to that though. We have to be concerned of toxicity of water sources because we have many, many lakes and uh, rivers where people's sewage is being dumped into these supplies and with sewage research shows comes all the medical drugs 
and chemicals that are going through people's bodies and then they get into your body and they cannot be effectively filtered out of water. So what you end up getting is what I call a homeopathologic dose of chemicals. Um, so having a good water filtration system is always wise, but using high quality water is very good. I get water right from right over here in the mountains at Mount, uh, Mount Palomar, which is a very deep well into an underground water source and it's bottled in glass and it's very high quality, very clean water, which I then use uh, natural processes to charge and structure and I add a little salt to it and it's super high quality and I feel very good on it. So you always have to do the research to find good water sources, but you want natural spring waters or artesian waters or high quality well waters that uh, come from the deeper the better because then you get away from surface pollutants. So these things are very important because water is the basis of your biochemistry. Without water, there is no, all biochemical reactions in the, in the body are water dependent is what I'm implying. Next is nutrition. If you want to have normal biochemistry, then your first step is eating organic food because whenever you eat organic, you're reducing toxicity uh, significantly because you're avoiding farming chemicals. Now there's a lot of talk about farming chemicals blowing onto organic food uh, fields and all that stuff. That's all true, but remember, <laughs> that's not really an excuse to not eat organic food because what you get from blow-by or atmospheric delivery is still a microfraction of what you're getting when they just spray it right on the plants. And remember, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and rodenticides at large are prepared in fat soluble liquids so they stick to plants and don't wash off in the rain and then they get into your body and you're in big trouble. Those pesticides and chemicals like that, pesticides come in two classes, estrogenic and neurotoxic. So you got two choices with pesticides on food and all commercial food is gonna have a, a good high dose of that. I've researched that extensively. Um, Neurotoxic, those are chemicals that were designed for biological warfare and they will attack the nervous system and shut the nervous system down to the bugs, which means what, whatever dose you get, it's going to go after your nervous system and cause problems that relate to nervous system function. And estrogenic means that they use high levels of estrogens, which disrupts the reproductive cycle in the bugs so they can't reproduce and then they die off. And that's exactly what the birth control pill does to a woman. So if, if, if you want to have healthy biochemistry, naturally you don't want estrogenic and neurotoxic chemicals coming into your food or into your water, which is why you don't want to drink water from surface wells that can get contaminated by surrounding um, corporations, uh, factories, and of course uh, commercial farms, which are big culprits. I got a military helicopter flying by here, so sorry for the noise if you hear it. Now, the other thing is if you look at research on organic food, it on average carries about four times the nutrient density of commercial food. Certainly you're gonna find studies that say otherwise, but if you look deeply into that, you'll find a lot of those studies are funded by people that are invested in you having faulty beliefs. If you wanna get some good research, go to the British Soil Association and search through their library and you will find a lot of excellent research giving you the truth in that regard. So when we want to normalize our biochemistry, we want to look at the balance. I break this down very simply so people can understand it and it works beautifully. We have two basic classes of foods that we're going to be eating. What I call eyes foods or your flesh foods, which are your predominant sources of protein and fats that are the most bioavailable. So if you need protein and fat for your body, it's gonna be mostly, uh, it's gonna be most easily brought into the body and broken down and utilized through animal flesh and or fish, anything that has uh, eyeballs. So eyeballs equals flesh. That's not to say that there's not um, fats and proteins in plant foods, it's just that Proteins in plant foods are tied up in fiber and not everybody can digest effectively enough to extract enough protein out of plants 
This is why a lot of people run into problem on vegan and vegetarian type diets. And, and I know that very well because I spent a year and a half being a vegetarian so I could explore this in depth and experience how my body changed and how I had to work real hard with food combinations and a number of other things. And even doing a very good job of that, I was losing a lot of muscle mass and no matter how well I trained, it wouldn't stay on because I need flesh food. When I was young, I was a vegetarian and ended up becoming anemic because my body needed flesh foods. And my mother took me to a naturopath naturopathic physician. And he said, this kid needs a steak. That's all that's wrong with him. So as soon as I ate meat, everything normalized. It was like someone turned the lights back on. So when we look at this flesh food, if we eat more than our bodies need, it will increase acidity in our body, which will disrupt our biochemistry. That means it pulls the pH of the body down. So you're, uh, again, we have a variety of pHs, but the general influence on the pHs of the body is going to take you acid. And you can, I'll talk later about how you can measure that. If you need more alkalinity in your body, then you're gonna need more plant foods. They generally have an alkalizing effect on the body. So paying attention to the symptoms that you get, for example, whenever you get too much acid in your body, you're much more likely to have soreness in muscles and joints. That's one of the common reactions that you're gonna get and it makes it harder to recover from exercise. You get it from sitting in a chair, you feel stiff. It's like your body can't, it's like you're, you're, you know, like you're a machine that needs a grease job kind of feeling. Excess alkalinity usually use, leads to fatigue and a variety of different symptoms. It can be sores in the mouth, all sorts of interesting things. But either way you go, too much of either means you're not feeling ideal, which is a guarantee that your biochemistry is off. You can get wickedly complex. You can study this stuff for years uh, in functional medicine. But interestingly enough, most of the functional medicine practitioners need a guy like me to break it down to this level so they can get themselves right. All you gotta do is start looking at pictures of people that do functional medicine and doctors who are experts in the biochemistry of the body but not in the actual biochemistry of the body. Next is sleep. The average person needs eight hours a night and all this stuff is in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, just so you know in, in general. We need eight hours a night in cycle with the circadian rhythm because our whole hormonal system, which is our biochemistry, again, is driven by the sun and the moon and the earth itself. Your, the elevation of glucocorticoids, cortisol and other glucocorticoids, which are stimulating to the body and anti-inflammatory and that prepare us to do work, rise up with the sun and then they generally go down as evening approaches and as cortisol levels go down melatonin rises up and we get a greater release of androgen hormones at night for growth and repair so keeping in cycle with the sun down uh, by 10 i like people to be head on pillow ready to fall asleep by 10 30 and then rising up with the sun is the natural cycle and if you go against that cycle you can make all the excuses you want and I'm, I'm not saying to the shift workers stop your job I'm just saying whenever you go against the cycle no matter what excuse you make it's stressful to the body and there's a cost and one of the costs is is that if you skip as I show you in my book how to eat move and be healthy the first four hours at night the body tends to devote to physical repair and the second four hours into psychogenic repair so if you go to bed, and I've had many athletes with this problem, if you go to bed too late, the longer you wait to go to bed, the less time your body has to repair the physical structure and the more likely you are to have chronic musculoskeletal injuries or acquire a significant one. If you go to bed too late and you start missing sleep from about 2 a.m. onward, like what happens to a lot of uh, mothers that have new babies and they have to wake up to feed babies and can't fall back to sleep, you're much more likely to have cognitive disorders and neurological problems because that's the uh, parts of the body that the body focuses on in that cycle of sleep. So the key thing to remember is decreased sleep equals increased catabolic activity in the body because sleep 
itself is a process that is anabolic. Tissue rebuilding supports growth, repair, and ultimately learning. So as we get sleep deficient, we become more and more catabolic, which actually increases the likelihood that we're going to be far too acidic in our body. And if you go too far into acid or alkaline for each of the different compartments of the body, it disrupts the flow of energy and information in the body and leads to a large number of health challenges, such as mental emotional problems, energy problems, slow healing, heart palpitations, and the list just goes on, okay? Now, if, if your sleeping is off, any of the things that I discuss here, whatever brings stress levels up elevates adrenaline in the body and that triggers off elevations in cortisol and the body is extremely sensitive to these hormones and if they rise up past homeostatic levels or natural balance, then you will trigger off a mouth breathing reaction because the body thinks you're fighting or running for your life. So that's important to remember. Now up here you see Rx, that means prescription drugs. As a general rule of thumb, <laughs> prescription drugs just straight up equals chaos in the body. Uh, it, it completely, utterly baffles me how quick people are to run and get a drug from a doctor that's about 10 times more dangerous and problematic than the symptom that they're having. Uh, if you look at the side effects even marketed on television for a lot of these drugs, some, I, I look at this and I'm like, who in the world would actually take a drug that has those side effects because they don't sleep well? I mean, this is just crazy. But drugs are usually highly toxic to the body and they disrupt the biochemistry of the body significantly and they have many side effects that can cause knock-on problems that produce seemingly unrelated symptoms that are related such as back pain and uh, psychological dysfunctions and emotional problems and erectile dysfunction and digestive eliminative disorders and the list goes on. So the, the, the moral of this story is first do no harm. Food is man's best medicine as many of the greatest physicians have said. So remember whenever you start resorting to the use of uh, prescription drugs or even over-counter drugs you are playing with your biochemistry set and most people don't even come close to having the knowledge to know what the long-range effects or even the short-term effects of those drugs are. And unfortunately, a lot of the doctors don't know uh, very much at all. They're just reading out of a book and prescribing what somebody else told them to, but are often completely detached from the long-range effects of these things until someone dies and then they have to start looking into it. So try not to take that route to figure out the effects of drugs on your biochemistry. Now we're going to look at the yang elements, the masculine elements, which means moving faster, heating, drying, expressive elements. Thinking is a major issue. We talked about the uh, thinking issues earlier, so I won't go into that, but just remember, if you're thinking thoughts that are dream negative, in other words, if your thought processes are not affirmative of your dream goal or objective in life, then you could say that they're um, nightmare affirmative. And anytime your thought processes are unproductively stressful, it means that you're going to most likely have acidifying reactions in the body. That's my experience. And you're going to exhaust yourself of various resources. The harder you work the brain, the more you utilize resources. Remember, the brain is a very, very inefficient organ. It uses about 80% of the available blood sugar anytime it's cognitively engaged. So it's a massive sugar consumer, a massive resource consumer, and deficiencies in vitamins, minerals, trace minerals, hormones, enzymes, cofactors, all can create cognitive disorders that make your life a lot harder to live and make it a lot harder to be a happy, healthy, motivated, or and, and or inspired person. So whenever you're dealing with dream negative issues or dream negative thinking and it's producing stress, the first thing I would encourage you to do is ask yourself, am I living an outdated myth? An outdated myth means an outdated story. Am I uh, 
trying to live out some religious story, even though it's not working for me. And that story might have been written 2,000 years ago, but I don't know if you are aware, but 2,000 years ago, nobody flew airplanes, no one had smartphones, no one had cars. They thought the world was flat. They thought the earth was the center of the universe. Um, and I could go on and on and on. So, in other words, as the times change, research into mythology clearly shows that our myths need to change in order to integrate us into society within ourselves and within the world and the universe. Or we run into a lot of challenges, many painful challenges, and so if your story is not really congruent with reality, and by the way, reality is what's happening right now. Whatever's happening in your life, that's reality. As my buddy Laird Hamilton says, the truth is what works. So if your thinking and your story are not getting you there and they're adding stress, you're, you're, the side effect of living and thinking that way is going to be biochemical dysfunctions. And throwing pills at a person like that or telling them to drink more uh, carrot juice isn't the answer either. Next is breathing. Now, we have problems with breathing challenges that will disrupt our biochemistry, largely because of the effect on our pH levels. Holding the breath retains the gas CO2, which increases acidity in our body and can be very, very disruptive to all physiological processes. Breath holding is the classic reaction of a psychological introvert under stress. Research now shows that where most of us were thought, where all of us were thought to have fight flight reactions that elevated glucocorticoid speeded breathing and caused classic sympathetic reactions, they now find that introverts actually shut down. Their breathing comes not only to a standstill, but almost to a stop. And they go into a holding pattern, which is a freeze pattern. So you have fight and flight, run like hell, or fight like hell, or freeze. And if you freeze your breathing, your cell physiology keeps going, your heart keeps beating, but you're not bringing in oxygen to alkalinize your blood, so you get too much carbon dioxide relative to oxygen, which has an acidifying effect on the body, which can lead to lots of problems, and many people do this all the time. And their, their, their daily reaction to their negative thoughts and their other challenges is not to breathe more, it's to breathe less, which leads to just as many problems as breathing too fast does. The extroverts are going to hyperventilate, and with hyperventilation, classically comes mouth breathing. You don't get mouth breathing with breath holding because you stop breathing. By the way, with these people, the key thing is to focus on a full exhalation, getting the air out of you, letting go. And it's a metaphor for letting go of your stress, letting go of your stinking thinking, whatever it is that's clogging you up inside. If you remember, your breathing is part of your detoxification system as well. What do you, what do you think bad breath is? So if you're holding that stuff inside yourself, you're actually um, turning yourself into a chemical cesspool. So it's going to make your biochemistry very, very challenging. Hyperventilation causes the outgassing of too much CO2, which favors alkalinity, tr triggers an alkalinizing effect on the body. But if you get too alkaline, if the blood gets too alkaline, it favors the action of calcium in muscles, which causes muscle binding and leads to spasms and cramps. So when I see hyperventilation and mouth breathing in athletes, especially running athletes like sprinters, football players, rugby players, soccer players, triathletes, distance runners, etc., you see that with this hyperventilation and mouth breathing problem comes muscle cramping, muscle tears, and a lot of muscle injuries due to the dysfunction in the muscle's ability to contract and then release. A simple example that you're probably all familiar with, watch any weightlifting competition, and when you see somebody approach a heavy weight, like in an Olympic lifting competition or a powerlifting competition, without even knowing why, they start hyperventilating. <laughs> start hitting themselves, get all jacked up. That's because they're alkalinizing their blood without even knowing why, which favors the action of muscle contraction. So we do these things 
innately without even knowing why we do them. So to recoup, uh, to, to recap, holding the breath or slowing the breath down too much causes the retention of CO2, increases acidity in the body, throws your biochemistry off. Hyperventilation, which always, in my opinion, comes with mouth breathing because it's a stress reaction, it's a fight or flight reaction, and the body thinks you're going to have to run and fight, so it wants as much air as it can get, leads to increase alkalinity in the blood, which has negative effects on your biochemistry and for athletes and people in general causes muscle problems. And, and all the problems I listed in the very first segment, any of these can cause all those problems that I listed in, in our overview section. Movement, too much energy means increased catabolic effects on the body. Catabolic again means tissue destructive, which leads to increased acidity. So if you're over exercising, you're going to have increased Acidity, which is going to increase toxicity in your body. Your body too, gets too acid and it becomes toxic inside. If you're not getting enough movement, then you become uh, paradoxically uh, stuck with a little conundrum here. If you don't get enough exercise to meet the demands of the activities of daily living and being in a field of gravity, and you get to be like a lot of people I see that are obese, for example, or overly sedentary, they can't even walk halfway up a flight of stairs before they're exhausted and they have to rest. So here's the key thing I want to point out. If you are sedentary enough, you get to the point where even walking across the room is a form of overtraining for you. I found a research study a few years back where they went in and did VO2 max testing on people in doctor's offices to determine how much stress they were under, um, oxidatively or energetically, and they found 50% of people in doctor's waiting rooms could not walk from the waiting room to the examination room without hitting their lactate threshold, which is about what would happen if you ran uh, 220 meters as hard as you could, you'd probably uh, start hitting your lactate threshold around then. Uh, so to not be able to walk, it means that you're no longer able to get there on anaerobic energy and that you're already burning out the uh, energy supplies and producing so much lactic acid that it's becoming disruptive to your energy production. In other words, now you've got to go into the aerobic energy system which means it's showing that they're, they're already exhausted in, in, is a good way to look at it. So if you detrain the body, then just being in a field of gravity and doing activities of daily living becomes overtraining, and lo and behold, you're back to hyperventilation because just walking up and down the stairs or putting groceries in your car is so stressful, your body has a stress response, and that comes with mouth breathing, and the challenges that we've been talking about. Also, if you're not getting enough exercise, it leads to stagnation of fluids in the body. And whenever you don't have fluids moving through the body, your biochemistry gets disrupted because remember your biochemistry is about the flow of energy and information. So if energy and information gets trapped, think of what constipation is. It is the disruption of the natural fluids of, of fluids and substances in the body that leads to toxicity in the body. If urine doesn't flow, you're in trouble. If blood doesn't flow, you're in trouble. If lymphatic fluid does not flow, you're in trouble. And the list just goes on and on. So if you are out of balance with too much or too little exercise, you're going to make your body pHs go off. You're going to be most likely too acid. You're going to become toxic. You're going to become a hyperventilator. And you're going to probably have a mouth breathing uh, problem going on that brings all that toxicity of breathing through your mouth, not your nose. All of this, by the way, is a fantastic way to set yourself up for fungal and parasite infections. And overtraining or undertraining lead to energetic imbalances because you're not able to effectively utilize the energy produced by movement itself. I don't have time to go into all those things because I give entire lectures on that. But the point I want to make is that either of these things sets you up for energetic dysfunctions that lead to commonly the overconsumption of quick energy drinks and foods, all of which are very good foods for funguses and parasites. And uh, let me tell you, when you get a few billion organisms pissing and pooping 
in your body, it will screw your biochemistry up royally. And I have seen many, many cases of that. And I was one of them at one time and had to heal myself from that, which is a very powerful learning experience about managing stress and every other thing that you can come across, which I would encourage you not to have to get into. Uh, although about 90%, as I said, of the world population has a fungal and a parasite infection right now. Another point, though, is that when you have that, those fungal and parasite issues, they, have, they give you cravings for things like sugar that will really screw up your biochemistry. And I want to make a key point here, which I'm, well, I'll reiterate that to you in our conclusions over here, but when you start feeding parasites and they start releasing their chemicals, many of those parasites release chemicals that have a negative effect on the immune system's ability to communicate, particularly fungal infections. Fungi release chemicals that basically completely disrupt your immune system so it can't communicate effectively and leave you wide open to all sorts of infections, including parasite infections. So these things are not things to mess around with, which is why I produced a DVD series called Healing Fungal and Parasite Infections, The Absolute Essentials, and it's simple, but comprehensive, meaning that the things you got to do are quite simple, but the number of things you need to be aware of on a daily basis so you don't completely screw your biochemistry up and become something worse than a mouth breather is uh, important to know, and they're all laid out in that program. And that program is understandable by, uh, you know, an intelligent 12-year-old, but most people are completely unaware of how they can uh, protect themselves and heal themselves from fungal and parasite infections. So check into that if you think that might be a concern. If you go to the Institute, you can probably find my free report where I list all the symptoms there. Okay, so we've now looked at thinking, breathing, movement, nutrition, hydration, sleep, and chaos or drugs. So let me give you some closing tips. One, uh, take holistic lifestyle coach level one. Reading my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, is a very, very wise idea. For 25 bucks, you're probably going to learn more about yourself than you will in 150 doctor's visits. If you're lucky, it might take 27,000 of them. Not to be mean to doctors, they're doing what they're trained to do. But what they're trained to do is not tell you what's causing the problem. They're trained to make the pain go away, which is what most people want without realizing it isn't helping. The things that you need to know that aren't in the book are in my ebook, multimedia ebook, The Last Four Doctors Will Ever Need How to Get Healthy Now, where I show you how to establish healthy four doctor core values so you have your own inner guidance system so you know when to say yes and when to say no to each of the things that relates to your six foundation principles. HLC1 actually gives you three days of training by a very masterful instructor and allows you to ask lots of questions so you can get your head straightened out and feel like you understand what you're doing and then you can really uh, have a clear sense of direction with these things. So our first tip beside that is monitor your diet and exercise, your thoughts, your exercise reactions, how your body feels, bowel movements, urine, all the things that you need to write down. This is according, this is supposing you're a mouth breather and you're having challenges, and this is for anybody that's not healthy. Keep a log. I recommend you use a day timer or a calendar function on your phone. Write down everything, how you're thinking. If you're having negative thoughts, write down the time you're having these negative thoughts because that could correlate to other things such as how you're exercising or how you're eating. And a therapist can look at those, especially a Czech holistic lifestyle coach, and they know how to make these correlations. Uh, what do your bowel movements look like? I show you how to read those in the book, How to Eat Be Healthy. What does your urine look like? Is it strong smelling? Is it dark? How frequent is it? How much are you having? Normal, too little, exceed, seemingly extremely large amount, which most people are aware of. What's your body temperature like? Do you feel normal? Do you feel cold? Do you feel hot? How's the condition of your skin? Do you have pimples? Do you, are you aging? Is your skin aging faster than it should? Is it all dried out and wrinkly? 
Are you losing the oil in your skin? Is your skin dried out? Is it too greasy? These are all things that change as your biochemistry changes and can be related to mouth breathing problems. Are you having swelling in your body? Are you gaining weight? Um, how's your sexual performance? How's your recovery from exercise? All those things, if you monitor them, as you're monitoring all this and adjusting your ratio of animal or flesh foods to plant foods and some of the other specifics I show in my book, then you can see how these things are changing, how much water are you drinking, what kind of water, if I've been drinking soda pop, what came on, did I start getting pimples, did I get nervous, did I start breathing faster, etc. You have to look at all this stuff so you can see what's related to what. Next is pH monitoring. You can easily go to a drugstore or right on Amazon and get what are called pH strips. They're just little sticks, about a quarter of an inch wide, maybe two and a half or three inches, three or four inches long. You can dip them into fluids and things like that, and they will have a color response, and you can look on the scale, it'll tell you what the pH is. I did this for quite some time years ago when I was studying, studying functional medicine with uh, Bill Timmons, the founder of Biohealth Diagnostics. And I did a lot of specific training in functional medicine because I wanted to understand how all this stuff works. And I was also a little concerned about the whole theory of, of needing to eat a vegetarian diet to alkalinize the body and all the sort of stuff that was going around and, and this theory that eating meat would acidify your body. So I tested everything. And what I did for quite some time is I monitored my urine pH every time I took a pee and I recorded it. And I check my salivary pH several times a day. I did it before workouts, after workouts, before meals, after meals, in the morning, before bed. And I was able to see what I, what I was doing, what I was eating, what I was drinking, how I was sleeping, and how I was training. And how did that affect pH ratios at salivary and urinary levels? And it's quite interesting. And believe me, I found out something interesting. You can eat meat all day long and you will get a minor shift toward acid compared to one good hard weightlifting workout. I could make my body, I could make my urinary pH drop all the way down to 4.9 with a, just a good solid workout and my salivary pH drop down to uh, 6 easy, 5, 9, 6 just from lifting weights real heavy but eating nothing but meat would only drop it uh, uh, maybe from 7 to 6.8 for example. So monitor your AM urine. Your AM urine should range between 5 and 7 pH. But by monitoring your urine throughout the day and paying attention to what your saliva, check your saliva with the same system, different stick, same system. Saliva should be 6.5 to 7. So what is it before a meal? What is it before you drink that Red Bull? What is it an hour later and two hours later? Experiment by adding and subtracting things and see what your pH is doing and pay close attention to what your pH levels are at the urinary level and salivary level when you're feeling good and your mind is working good and when your body looks good. And you might find, geez, when your urine goes acid, your body gets hot and swollen, but when it goes more alkaline, you tighten up and feel better. Or if you're too alkaline, you might feel that your body looks fine in the mirror, but you feel like a dish rag on the inside. You got no power in you. So there's, there's very unique reactions to these things. You can't say that everybody should be this way, except for when you get to blood, blood stays pretty tight around 7.35 uh, pH. So monitor all these things. If you're getting too much acid, it's wise to try increasing plant foods and water and decrease toxicity in your diet. So if you're taking medical drugs or over-the-counter drugs, notice what happens if, you're, if you can get your, uh, when you come to the end of a prescription, see what happens. Or if you don't need to take the drugs, don't take them. See what the pH levels do, and then if it's safe, try taking it. See what the pH levels do for the next 24 to 72 hours. Don't do anything without your physician's approval, though. These are just suggestions I'm making that you can only do if they're safe to do. I'm not encouraging you to do anything silly out there. 
Okay, so remember, if you get too much acidity in your body, plant food, increase water, and decrease toxicity through every means that you can. Next, remove processed foods. Sugar, and sugars in general. Processed sugar is a real problem. Classic table sugar, as most people are using out there, is extremely acid. Candace Pert says in her book, Molecules of Emotion, it should be considered a class one drug because it's as addictive as heroin, morphine, and other class one drugs. It's highly acidic and it robs your vitamins of, uh, body of vitamins, minerals, trace minerals, and nutrients at a very, very extreme rate. There's many books written on that. Eating uh, processed sugar in any form, and it's hidden in all sorts of stuff, even meats, is extremely dangerous and acidifies your body. So here's how that relates to mouth breathing. You cannot correct breathing pattern disorders as long as people are eating processed sugar because it acidifies the blood so quickly you immediately have to start hyperventilating in order to alkalinize your blood to keep your body alive. So if you've got any kind of breathing pattern disorder, processed sugar's got to go. If you want sugar, get it from natural sources like fruit, vegetables. Remember, carbohydrates are all sugars in one form or another. You don't have to eat high, super concentrated sugars, especially bleached, toxic, commercially grown crap. So remove the, 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 the excess sugars, remove pasteurized dairy. I, I've never known anybody on this planet in all my years that did well on pasteurized dairy. Remember, pasteurized means no enzyme activity, which means if you're eating pasteurized anything, your body has to come up with the enzymes to break it down and you can easily become enzyme deficient. The average person that I see by the time you're 30 to 32 years of age has already got significant enzyme depletion and has to go on digestive enzymes to supplement to give the body a chance to repair itself. And that's not wise to do to burn yourself out of enzymes because you're eating pasteurized stuff. And if you look into the whole concept of pasteurization and you get right to the roots of it, it's corporate silliness is what it is. It's a, it's a bunch of mocked up hype stories about the dangers of raw milk and all that stuff, which is a lot more people get sick from pasteurized anything than they do from raw food. So let's just get that one straight. Uh, next, commercial meat and fish. If you want to screw your biochemistry up, then just keep eating commercially bought and raised uh, meat and fish. Fish farming is an unregulated industry that uses a lot of dangerous chemicals that have not been tested and approved by the FDA or anybody else. Commercial farms, as I mentioned, are highly toxic. So that all those chemicals, if you eat it, it's in you. Simple as that. So if you want to balance your biochemistry so you can breathe properly and think properly and live your dream, get rid of, to the best of your ability, commercial anything. If you are tight on your budget, then get Joe Rushton's book, Rocket Fuel on a Budget. It teaches you how to eat well the most cost effectively you can. Joe Rushton, J-O Rushton, Rocket Fuel on a Budget. She's one of my holistic lifestyle instructors. She's a beautiful, intelligent woman. She's a qualified chef and a master at all this stuff. Read that book if you're on a tight budget. Okay, um, and then remember, fungal and parasite cleanse. Uh, there's a, too many symptoms of fungal and parasite problems, but basically almost everything that falls into biochemical problems falls into the symptoms of fungal and parasite problems, from skin problems to cognitive problems to sexual dysfunction to joint pathology to organ and gland dysfunction to swollen bodies to overweight bodies to itchy noses, itchy rectums, uh, sores in the mouth, sores in the eyes, itchy ears, uh, muscle aches and pains, poor sleep quality. I mean, these things can cause a lot of problems. So that brings us to the end of our series, The Challenges of Mouth Breathing. We did an overview. We looked at the ge genetic and structural factors. We looked at the mental emotional factors. And now we look at it from a biochemical perspective. It's a big problem out there. It can really disrupt your ability to live your dream effectively because you cannot effectively oxygenate yourself and maintain the right balance of biochemistry, uh, particularly due to acid alkaline imbalances and due to uh, imbalance in the gases 
of CO2 and oxygen, which have to be carefully regulated. And as I said, if they're not regulated properly, it creates dysfunctions or imbalances in the nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. And remember, the autonomic nervous system is autonomic, which means automatic, because it's what keeps you alive. And if it was reg regulated at the cognitive level, you'd forget to breathe or forget to digest and you would be dead anyhow. So the more autonomic problems you have, such as irregular heart rate, irregular breathing, irregular urination, bowel movement, healing, the closer to being dead that you are. So I say let's honor that autonomic system and honor what I just shared with you because this is the things that cause the problems that people keep running to doctors and therapists for at large. Thanks for joining me. Look forward to seeing you at Holistic Lifestyle Coach Level 1 or any of my other courses such as Check Exercise Coach, which is a great entry-level program. Enjoy how to eat, move, and be healthy in the last four doctors you'll ever need. How to get healthy now. I'm Paul Check.